Hello, my name's Bill Rowe, and we're talking from the Noble Grove down in the Okeechobee, Florida area. Uh, it's a large piece of property that's oranges and uh, a big planting of new variety tangerines. So the citrus industry is comprised of many different parts. Um, primarily you've got the groves, but you've got the packing operation, you've got the juice plant operation, and you've got the nursery business. And each one is a very complex industry each and of itself. So the nursery industry in Florida is quite regulated. We've got quite a bit of disease pressure from canker, greening, and other uh, maladies we've had for a long time. And so, while they used to have outdoor nurseries in Florida up to 25 years ago, we don't have outside nurseries anymore. Uh, there's a regulation by the state that every nursery has got to be at least a mile from any citrus grove. And all nurseries have to be in a screen house that prevents outside insects from uh, spreading or vectoring any disease that might be out there. They're inspected once a month by Florida Department of Agriculture. And so it's quite a sophisticated industry. Uh, they plant the seeds in little liners and the seeds have to grow up and sprout so that they're big enough to bud. And when I say bud, we have a seed stock and we are, are a root stock, if you will, and we have a scion or a sweet stock. And those two have to be brought together in a process they call budding. Um, on a big tree, you would graft one variety to another one, but on a small uh, plant like a, a citrus seedling, it's called budding. And so they'll bud the sweet stock onto the root stock, wrap it with a piece of tape, and when the bud starts to sprout and grow, they'll bend the root stock over and, and cut, cut it off so that you now have just one shoot going up and it's a combination of a root stock and a sweet stock. Site selection for a citrus grove is very important. And the first thing you're looking for is a piece of soil that's got the right types of soil. It's not too heavily laden with clay. Um, historically, citrus was grown on the sand hills in uh, north central Florida where there's no drainage problem. Citrus trees are very susceptible to wet feet, and so wherever you develop a citrus grove, you've got to make sure it's engineered to have good drainage. Um, so site selection is number one. You would select a site, buy a piece of property, lease a piece of property, and at the same time, you would go to a nurseryman and order the type and variety of trees that you want to have, because it takes about a year to grow the trees and it takes about a year to develop a piece of property and have it ready to plant. So across this 3,500 acres of property here, we've got uh, a couple thousand acres of mature grove with quite a bit of young trees embedded in it. We've got trees that were planted uh, eight, 10 months ago now. Um, got these trees that are planted just three, three months ago now. And We've got a planting of mid-sized trees. It's uh, probably 60, 80 acres, as I think you already took a shot of. Um, and we expect this grove to be fully planted in five years. Uh, so we'll have a 1,500-acre young to medium-aged tangerine grow pretty quick. Well, what I've done here is I've dug this hole and I've loosened the soil up real much so the tree is going to take off with the roots and the feeder roots will just flare out. I always uh, break the bottom off a little bit so you don't have any circular roots there. And the first thing you do is make sure your roots are not going to get bent back so you want to make sure it's deep enough. And as you put the dirt in, you want to make sure there's no air pockets around this root mass at all. So you pack it very tightly like that, and then if you do anything, you pull it up just a little bit so those roots, anything that did get turned back up, will straighten back out. Almost the last thing we do is 
to put a nine ounces of slow release fertilizer around here. This is high potency fertilizer, very high quality stuff, but it's 85% slow release. So I won't burn the tree by putting so much right close to it. So I'm gonna put the wrap on and the wraps to keep the sprouts from growing. Um, you'll see most of the wraps in this planting are stapled on. And that's because the raccoons are devilish little boogers and they'll pull these wraps off just about as fast as I can twist tie them on. They're very adept with their little hands. And so this may be a futile effort, but I don't have a staple gun with me. And I'm twisting it a few extra times just to try to stymie them a little bit. I want to show you about this irrigation system here, which is fairly unique in the industry. Here we've got a microjet system, which is a frost protection system, and it comes up to this microjet here. It shoots up on a 60 degree angle and it's 60 degrees wide. So all the water off this jet is focused right on this point right here. And that's very critical in a significant freeze event to make sure we're building a uh, literally an uh, Eskimo lodge of, of ice right in the critical spot. Um, the other part of this irrigation system is that this is a drip line here. And so we're running the irrigation as a drip system with fertigation and everything that that brings to us. And it gives us the added benefit of having frost protection with the microjets. Much more expensive than a traditional installation of microjets only. And they use the microjets for both fertigation, frost protection, and irrigation. But the we feel like the drip system is far superior, both for irrigation, cost of management of irrigation, fertigation, and then we've got a superior frost protection system with these microjets specifically designed just for frost protection and not for irrigation and other purposes. So maintaining a citrus grove is a, as much an art as it is a, a job. Um, we're citrus farmers for the most part and we're dealing with weather and we're dealing with fertilizer and weed growth and controlling weed growth and we're controlling pests or fungus or bacteria and so it's a, a pretty interesting blend of activities. Uh, we're fertilizing in the fall, winter, spring. We, we try not to fertilize in the summer or we don't fertilize in the summer in the rainy season so we don't have any leaching. Um, we're controlling weeds primarily before the fruit gets ripe and then after the fruit is harvested because we don't want to be knocking fruit off if it's ripe. Um, our spray program is engineered uh, to control mites that will knock leaves off, to control fungus that might have a latent infection that causes leaves to fall off in the winter. Um, we're battling uh, citrus canker, which is a bacterial disease that uh, has to be controlled all throughout the growing season. And then we're battling the uh, big greening disease, which is the 800-pound gorilla in Florida agriculture right now. Um, and it's a worldwide problem, but it has decimated the Florida industry. And uh, it's the primary focus of all growers still in the business today, trying to uh, be profitable in the age of greening. So previously, y'all saw the fruit being picked and harvested in the field, and now you're gonna see it come through the packing house and flow through the various uh, cleaning processes and be packed up and put in the cooler. So the stages of fruit movement through the packing house, uh, number one is the degreening process. The degreening process is something that goes on with many different fruits and vegetables, um, particularly tomatoes, bananas, and citrus. And that's where the fruit is put in a room with 95% humidity and typically over 80 degrees, but the lemons try to be cooler than 80 degrees. And you inject ethylene gas at five parts per million into the atmosphere with fans blowing, with the air being changed out once an hour. 
and over the course of 24 or 36 hours, the fruit develops a higher orange color, or in the case of tomatoes, it goes from greenish to red, and bananas, it goes from greenish to yellow. After the degreening process, fruit gets put on the line, it's dumped, and the first grater it goes by is the grater that's pulling out sticks or rough debris. Um, then it goes through a little bouncing conveyor that causes fruit, we call it the punch belt sizer, and it's got a bunch of small holes in it where all the undersized fruit drops out. So we're not bothering to handle fruit that's well undersized. After the punch belt sizer, the fruit goes through a brush washer and it's got soap and it's also a sanitizer and a bactericide. It goes through the brush washer, gets rinsed off. Immediately after it's rinsed off, it's sprayed with parasitic acid, which is a sanitizer that lasts on the fruit for 45 seconds. After 45 seconds, parasitic acid is oxidized out. But in that process, the parasitic acid sanitizes our equipment all the way up to the dryer. So all day long, there's a sanitation process going on while the fruit's wet and through their initial grade process. After the initial grade process, where they throw out any rotten fruit or plugs, the fruit goes through a dryer and it's a steel roller. This is air blowing on top of a steel roller conveyor. And as soon as it goes, as soon as it's finished being dried, it goes through what they call a polishing bed. The polishing bed just prepares the peel for a wax and it just brushes it and causes it to be glossed up a little bit. And then it goes through a wax bed. The wax with citrus is impregnated with a fungicide to keep any blue-green mold from sprouting and sporing out. And after the wax bed, which is a carnauba wax, um, it goes through two dryers, which we call a presetter and then a final dryer before it goes to the final set of graders who now grade it down for grade defects, um, maybe any skin breakdown or other external um, defects the fruit might have before it turns the corner and runs through the sizer, which is a very sophisticated machine. The sizer takes very many pictures of each fruit in a cup. As the cups are rolling the fruit around, there's many pictures being taken, and it's taking pictures of color and blemish and size. And so after it comes through that sizer camera bed, each cup is programmed to drop the fruit in various drops along the way that are for that particular size and that particular color. And if the fruit is too green, it gets thrown down another chute. And if it needs one kind of sticker because it's a big fruit, it's programmed to get that kind of sticker versus a smaller sticker for a smaller kind of fruit. After the sizer puts fruit in particular drops, we place pack fruit in our packing house, particularly because we're a tangerine packing operation. Uh, place packing and having the top fruit turn blossom end up adds value to the final appearance. So what we're trying to achieve with what you might call the perfect pack is a fruit that's high color, uh, bright uh, peel color without any uh, damage from rust mite or other uh, field pest, um, nicely sized, and size means a lot to a consumer. It also means a lot to a packing operation because the bigger the fruit, the faster the operation runs, the more efficient it runs. And the same is largely true at the consumer level. Uh, nice big fruit sells very fast at the supermarket, and so the supermarket's asking for blemish-free, high color, nice large fruit. Citrus is just kind of iconic in Florida, and it's a wonderful way of life, and it's in my blood, and that's what I know how to do.